you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for staying. Um, for those of you um, who have seen the literature there, I'm done as a, about the obituaries, but really, as I went through the newspapers, it became uh, obvious that I needed to change it a little bit, and there was much more richer stuff in other ways. And anyway, so it's really about how death and dying was reported on in the Limerick 18th century newspapers. And for those of you who are not from Limerick, I'll just briefly go through uh, where you are today. Um, this is 1741 map of Limerick and um, in, the, in the 18th century. And you can see King John's Castle and St. Mary's Castle um, are there. There are only two bridges crossing the, the Shannon. You have Baal's Bridge on this end here, and you have Thoman Bridge further down. Um, uh, at the time, really, it was um, the, the demographic makeup really was of people from a Catholic, Protestant, Presbyterian, Methodist, Quakers, Anglican, and Jews. Uh, there was an ethnic makeup that were English, Irish, Dutch, French, and Portuguese, and later on, there were some North Americans. Um, there are two, again, as I mentioned, the two bridges. A third bridge was built eventually then um, called Bal's, uh, sorry, called Matthew Bridge, which was built by Edward Isolt uh, in the 1760s. And this connected us with what's known as the New Town area, right? which uh, saw the building of the Custom House in 1769. This is an aspirational map by Collis, right, of um, the uh, new area in Limerick, which is called Newtown Perry. And today, um, we've gone a little bit further out of town, as you can see, and uh, this is where you are today. Uh, Limerick printing, in a nutshell, okay, is, um, uh, was, was in line with developments with London and Dublin. Um, the ancillary trades, and when I speak of these, I include numerous ancillary trades involved in the production of books, Bibles, sermons, posters, tickets, handbills, chapbooks, ballads, and newspapers. Limerick has material evidence to suggest that there were at least 15 printers uh, were in production during the 18th century, 11 of whom were printing newspapers. This is a, an image of the newspaper titles during the century, and uh, this is an image of their just title bars. And notice the first newspaper is 1716, and it's called the Limerick Newsletter. Okay. Uh, but for the purpose of my talk today, I'm going to focus on uh, three main newspapers that remained in print throughout the 18th century. Andrew Welch's Monster Journal, John Farrar's Limerick Chronicle, and Andrew Watson's Limerick Chronicle, which he bought from Farrar in 1782 and remained in the Watson family and in various partnerships up to the 1830s. But the paper is still in print today and is under the, it comes under the Limerick leader. Throughout the 18th century, some milestones in Limerick printing, really, it's not as sparse as you might think. In 1739, the first weekly newspapers. In 1749, it becomes a bi-weekly newspaper. In 1759, the magazine of magazine is printed 600 pages monthly, and it did include biographical notices. The first dedicated bookshop was opened in 1767, but he's building on uh, previous people who had actually um, you didn't have a dedicated bookstore, it was, they sold books and drapery, books and wine, okay, which go well together. And uh, in 1787, there were, um, sorry, in 1769, we had two bi-weekly newspapers running concurrently, and by 1787, we had three newspapers running concurrently. In 1780, roughly, we have the Goggin, Goggins printing ballads, and by the 1790s, we had two circulating libraries. So the distribution networks included chapmen selling their wares in the streets at fairs and at assizes, and by the 1780s, printers were offering newspapers to be delivered daily within a 30-mile radius of the city. However, the very first newspaper of piece of evidence that we have that belongs to Limerick comes from 1741, and it's the Limerick Journal, printed by Andrew Welch. One extant copy exists in the National Library, and I'm very grateful that we were allowed to photograph it. How, however, in this very first newspaper, Andrew Welch included a short news item reporting um, stating that the death of the Queen of Sardinia had occurred. Okay. The source of the report was from the Duke of Grafton, who was an ambassador to and working at the royal court of the family in Sardinia. He gave instructions to the royal ho household on what they should do. Firstly, the whole house were to go into mourning, stating that the men were to wear black, full-trimmed black swords and buckles, fringed or plain linen, the ladies to wear silk or velvet, black and white fans, black and white fans, plain or fringed linen. This short report inserted by Andrew Welch was the beginning of a trend that followed in the newspapers throughout the century. There is an advertisement following that in 1749, and um, it's really an advertisement at the funeral board, um, uh, based in Bowling, um, and it's furnished with all necessary items for the decent 
solemnity of funerals in city and county, and he lists um, hatchments, escutcheons, hangings, sconces, large and small velvet cloth poles, um, closet, which I think means the coffin, tapes, etc. He all, they also advertise death heads for chapels, uh, chased furniture for coffins, silver or plain with, inscription, with um, inscription plates, and uh, figures for handles. Uh, the letters, etc., being um, uh, he advertises them as in kind of italic form, uh, and more reasonable. He maintains that he's more reasonable than the the, fur the funeral home that's currently there, run by poor widow Margaret Seymour. Seymour who, by the way, was assisted by the Herald Painters Office in Dublin, and really he just felt that she had a slight advantage on him. So anyway, so, and it's really about, uh, as you're reading it, it's a very small advertisement on his newspaper, and it's actually written at the side of the newspaper. It's not written on, you know, if you see your newspaper like this, um, it's looking down this, it's actually written along, you have to turn the paper around to read the, the, the bottom end of the newspaper to get the information. And it's about making the person in the coffin comfortable. Okay. Limerick newspapers in general included a significant number of short news items which could be termed hard news and which were, were of a political and economi uh, economic nature. But woven between these hard news items were soft news items designed specifically to engage the curiosity of their readers. These included regular accounts of high seas adventures and shipping disasters, items of, on the spread of disease and illness, the smallpox was rife in the 1760s, freak accidents, unusual occurrences such as earthquakes, hairy comets, and tidal waves, as well as the general effects of extreme weather conditions. This is a William Turner painting, which I think is, tells it all. It should be noted from the outset that every very few of these items refer to Limerick. Nonetheless, the manner in which the printer proprietors reported disasters and the manner in which society responded to them reflected the ways in which 18th century people sought to explain such calamities. An empirical approach was sometimes adopted, but it coexisted with an outlook that continued to read natural disasters in religious and even superstitious terms. However, as time progressed, we can detect shifting patterns in the way in which 18th century society tried to explain away the unusual occurrences. In 1750, the Munster Journal reported on its front page news that there was the readership of a very rare and unusual event, um, the sighting of the Aurora Borealis over Cork, and also a prodigious high tide. The author commented that the Aurora Borealis was moved from east to west and that it was colored red but that the city actually looked like it was in flames the author further described how the tide had swelled so high that the whole town uh, was almost underwater upwards of four feet um, and that the damage done to the merchants was incredible this emphasis on the costs incurred by merchants was significant and reflected a consistent concern with the reporting of events within the monster journal which in turn reflected the interests of the readership and if you can see there just it's boxes and all the kind of stuff that would be coming out of the merchant shops floating down the river. The Monster Journal also reported on rural accidents linked to sudden changes in weather conditions that resulted in landslides, flooding, and lightning-induced fires. And those reports also focused on the loss of damage, really to grain, fruit trees, and flaxseed, as well as the impact of damage on the supply of goods and prices. Later in the year, the Monster Journal reported that earthworks had been felt in London Welch's newspaper reports reflected the panic that resulted, giving graphic detail that would attract the readership. The shock was so great in some parts that the people ran from their houses and beds, almost naked, being in, in great consternation um, at this unusual visitation. Other reports also provide an insight into how these disasters were interpreted. In one incident, Welch uh, printed a full extract from Moore's Almanac for 1750, which linked ecli eclipses to earthquakes. However, while the opening paragraph noted a rational explanation linking earthquakes and eclipses, it suddenly changed tone and proceeded to link eclipses with the end of great civilizations, the coming of the Antichrist and the end of the world, which he had on good authority dated to 1766. And other responses came from letters to the printer. Authors were varied in their arguments from complete dismissal of the events to one author while citing Newton, then went on to justify his response. Really, it didn't matter what he thought it was. It really all came down to God. We know that the God of Jupiter, of Earth, and all nature is the primary cause of this and, all, and of all other great effects among his works. Indeed, the Monster Journal frequently resorted to religious explanations in order to understand the unusual. 
the theme of a vengeful God and the need for society to repent is permeated throughout the various poems selected by Welsh. Indeed, one English author noted that, I hope the late repeated alarm will um, excite such attention as to free a penitent people from any, from any other further terrors. Andrew Welch included his poem in full, 75 lines. I won't be reading it today, you're okay. Its content reflected the twin themes of a vengeful God and the need for repentance. And this is before the great artwork in Lisbon in 1755. Printer proprietors disseminated notices and information from the Dublin Society, which highlights the role of the provincial press in the dissemination of new knowledge concerning the treatment and, of preve and prevention of disease, both in animals and humans. Reports also offered an insight into the varied and conflicting responses of individuals, communities and governments as they struggle to contain disease. Mid 18th century, Poland used the military to protect its borders and, and stopped all animals entering the country. Genoa introduced quarantine. No goods were to be imported to or from, or imported from, so I should say, uh, Algiers. In one incident, disease also affected Irish cattle. Andrew Welch printed a cure taken from the London Gazette involving a mixture of urine, pigeon's dung, horse powder or diaport, sweet butter and eggs, including their shells. However, Welch later printed reports as if to contradict himself, doubting his, the e efficacy of this kind of, tr uh, this kind of cure. And basically, he, he put it down that basically that animals that hadn't been interfered with with these cures that was let run free, should they just ran it out of themselves and they survived, okay? <laughs> so the same news item went, on, went so far as to argue that farmers were con contributing to the spread of disease by ignoring advice on how to contain it. Andrew Welch kept his readers abreast of new treatments and indeed what becomes obvious is that these reports show that communities have an increasing awareness of cross-contamination and potentially the potential damages of, uh, and effects of air pollution. All those who keep horses in stables should immediately send the dung and litter out of town as the smoke and vapours arising from, the, from them may affect the air. And others suggesting um, that how to contain disease was not to let swine run through the streets. During the winter of 1750 and 1751, the Munster Journal carried frequent reports on the deaths of children and adults across continental Europe and England from sore throats and bouts of coughing. While printer proprietors could claim there was a certain usefulness in keeping the public aware, one cannot ignore the fact that Limerick printer proprietors during the 18th century subsidized their printing business by selling various cures and remedies. However, one reader in the Munster Journal calling himself philanthropo corresponded with Welch and suggested that it might be of a public service to include his advice, which came from the most eminent physicians in England. The language used indicates that the author had a detailed knowledge of biology and chemistry and was aware of various contemporary experiments ongoing in France and England. The remedies suggested including bleeding and purging, the use of camphor, grains of snake root, gargling, mulberries, and a honey of roses, a tincture of myrrh, and even unguentum adipticum, conveyed to the part of a rag tied to the end of a probe or a little stick. Children, he noted, might have difficulty gargling, but sweet oil of almonds in which a few grains of camphor could be dissolved and used as an alternative. Not all readers were convinced of the benefits of medicine. The same edition of the Munster Journal included another letter to the printer, suggesting that there was no need for doctors at all. This author described in graphic detail how a mild procedure to cure an inflammation in his eye resulted in him having a tendon severed in his arm. The letter then went on to describe that what could only be described as a litany of disasters that included swelling, weeping, inflammation, pain, and a universal tumour of the arm. In the end, he consulted a book on anatomy, applied a common poultice of, of milk and bread, tied his arm up with a bandage, allowed the arm to rest, and effectively cured himself. Indeed, he was going to hold his arm out to the service for everybody to see because really it came down to it, he cured himself. <laughs> a significant amount of news, though, s disseminated through the newspapers involved accounts of ag accidental et deaths from shootings, fires, and drowning. Uh, for one, exam one example, uh, in 1749, Andrew Welch reported that last week a haymaker attempting to steal a duck out of a pond was unhappily drowned. So 25 years later, in 1774, John Farrar uh, included short reports uh, of accidental drownings, generally under the heading of Limerick News. And he noted that four coopers in a cot coming down from Thomond Bridge um, overset. When Reddy and O'Donnell, two young men of good char character, were drowned. 
Though several boats put off in their, um, to their assistance, the third swam ashore at the barracks, no name mentioned, and the fourth was saved by laying um, hold of the cot on which he floated down to the quay. In August of the same year, he included a two-line notice that stated that Mr. James Menahan, shopkeeper, to Mr. Barry, woolen draper, and a young man of good character returning home from Rathkeel races was thrown from his, the, his horse to the bridge, at the Bridge of Adair and died the next morning. By 1782, drowning accidents um, were still reported on, but again, as I say, the names were not always given and appeared to have mostly occurred when people fell out of turf boats. However, these have to be viewed in the context of increased regulation of these boats for tax purposes, and the implication in these notices is that these boats, and indeed, indeed the people in them, were unreliable. A substantial number of accidents were due to chimneys collapsing and roofs falling in, but not all of them were due to bad workmanship. In one case, it was due to a gunpowder explo explosion um, and a Dublin Catholic Catholic Church where the, the roof fell in and uh, several people were killed but one Anne Cassidy, her leg and arm were broken but it thought that she could not recover. Catherine Kilbride's two legs were broken and Pincham Redmond's thigh was broken also but now in Mercer Hospital. Two months later though, uh, Welch did our Farrar noted that um, one of the victims, Anne Cassidy, um, had died. The reporting of accidents was also used to make other points at another funeral in Kevin Street, also in Dublin, the roof gave away. Um, sorry. The report suggested cultural differences relating to death because here it says, and it's the first time I've, I clicked on it uh, or when I was reading it that I found any reference to anything that was something of a funeral that I would have understood. But anyway, yesterday evening at a house in Kevin Street uh, where a dead corpse, according to a very vile custom, was waking. The roof gave in, fell on the company and broke away many skulls and limbs and dangerously uh, wounded others um, whose lives were despaired of. Okay. In 1792, uh, Andrew Watson um, continued to report on accidental shootings, drownings, etc. Now he had, uh, but now he had a hem heavy emphasis on fires. However, it must be borne in mind that Andrew Welch now, Andrew Watson, should I say, this is 1782 and 1792, um, John Farrar at this point, both of them were agents for the Dublin Insurance Company and the Hibernian Insurance, Insurance Company, and the reports may have been their way of raising interest among the public in the insurance they sold. In January 1785, the Limerick Chronicle reported on a fire which had occurred in an un uninhabited house in the city, apparently started deliberately. A reward was offered for the conviction of the perpetrators, and Watson included a list of 41 persons who offered various sums of money. Both Farrar and Watson, you'll be glad to know, were at the top of the list. However, the money they were donating was from the insurance company. <laughs> um, and in July 20, uh, 1785, he also advertised under Limerick News a notice that due to the increased use of damage caused by fire balloons, and one was already had already taken place, that the insurance risk for thatched houses was going to go up, sad to say. But this has to be viewed in the context of the impending balloon experiment that was about to occur in Limerick at that time. Indeed, in the same issue, he also reported um, a fire which had occurred in Limerick and in which three dwelling houses had been lost, and Mr. Peacock, a local chandler, had lost his goods valued at £300, while several families were distressed. Luckily, however, there was a fire engine available, good publicity for the insurance business, and the army was able to assist so that the fire was contained after three hours. The inclusion of biographical notices in the Limerick newspapers became the norm over time. Limerick readers were reticent to announce their much private matters in a public way. The elite in society did include biographical details, however, in Eggshaw's magazine uh, and indeed Limerick's own magazine of magazines in the 1750s, but over time they began to use the newspaper as a way of communicating with the local readership. These, bio these um, bi biographical notices varied in size from one line to full columns in the newspaper. Causes of death again varied from natural causes, fevers, choking and excessive drinking. Some notices highlighted the deceased achievements, such as an eminent painter, or in the case of Mr. Van Beaver, famed for his tapestries at the house in World's End Lane. Other notices noticed, noticed the illness that caused the death um, in the Dublin News, which noted that a Mr. Christopher Pawsey, clerk of the Corporation of Shoemakers, died, and it just says apoplexy. On the other, on the 
or in the other case of a gentleman, a single line, which said Limerick um, died from smallpox, a Lieutenant Monsell, son of Mr. John Monsell. Another death notice read, died from after a tedious illness, Lieutenant Ronald Campbell of John Murray's Regiment of Foot. Some people just died of old age and natural causes, as this notice reflects, De reflects sorry. death of a man 106 years of age who had all, always enjoyed a great share of life, of health. But it doesn't give his name. Okay. Several incident accidents, again, were attributed to excessive drinking and the reporting usually carried a moral tone, such as one Thomas Smith, a nailer in Black Horse Lane, got a cask of brandy and having made a vent, sucked so much liquor through a quill as killed himself in three hours. In another notice, the names were not printed but read as, yesterday four poor ignorant creatures died with excessive drinking of whiskey and several others were thrown into convulsions by drinking of brandy. Another would have died with the whiskey had not a master of a ship come in and helped and saved him. And finally, really, uh, the, yep, the Monster Journal also includes reports of people at the fear of being buried alive. A few days ago, a farrier in the County Mead, who was thought to, um, to have died in the morning, uh, was buried in the afternoon, but luckily for him, he escaped and managed to walk home to the great surprise of the family. And uh, looking at this, it was safety for the dead. Is that what the lid is for, to keep you in? Okay. But in June 1750, Welsh included another letter from Philanthropo on the front page of his newspaper. The author stated that he was responding specifically to an article um, that had, he had where he had read about these um, early bur burials. And um, I won't go to read the whole quote, but he just basically said, he outlines really that um, neither the apparent want of feeling for pulse or respiration or p nor painless, cold or inflexibility of the limbs are decisive in this case. Even the most industrious arts of exploring uh, a latent principle of life have been found precarious. The application of a mirror or the flame or of, a, or of a candle to the mouth and nostrils of a glass and water on the chest, nay pricking and burning even failed. So doctors were experimenting and from the four experiments he listed from Paris, Montpellier, Bath and London, which had successfully attempted to determine, uh, unsuccessfully attempted to, attempted to determine a means of testing whether a patient was really dead. He concluded that whatever other consequences may be drawn from them, they clearly demonstrate that the uniting principles between soul and body are much more delicate, more remote than has been generally imagined. And this illustrates the dilemma in 18th century. People found themselves in the face of newer scientific th thinking on the judgment and time of death. By 1769, a change in emphasis. How much? OK. Uh, OK, all right, I'll just finish this. OK, so uh, there's a change in emphasis again. And they, it goes on. And it, uh, actually, um, the death notices include um, uh, highlighting people's uh, charitable nature. OK. and and. It's long-winded, I won't read it, needless to say, followed by poetry. Um, one notice read, of, uh, again, of a William um, White who was a linen draper and a man of strictest integ integrity. Other middling sort notices were shopkeepers, attorneys, a, a shoemaker and a tobacconist. There was only one reference to a pre the death of a Catholic priest, simply noting his name and address, omitting further details or comment on his utility to society. society. It simply read, died last week near Kilpig, Kilpeacon, Reverend Mr. Hanron, a clergyman of the Church of Rome. And it should be noted that um, it, this was uh, John Hanron, who had been educated in Paris and evidently died a very wealthy man, for he founded bursaries for Irish students in the French capital. And I have to thank Lee Merwin for that information. And then finally, I'm down to the last bit. Um, uh, yes, in November, again, uh, in 1780s, uh, Andrew Watson printed uh, what I could describe was a funeral, okay, um, procession. Uh, his remain, and it was for um, a John O'Brien, a merchant in Limerick. Um, his remains were yesterday taken for interment to the family vault near Currafin in County Clare, attended by a numerous train of friends and fellow citizens on horseback and carriages. And we recollect um, and on any similar melancholy events in the city. But basically, he also followed up two weeks later as it's going through Ennis. He notes that the Ennis closed down as well as they were going through with, with a great number of carriages. And uh, my final point really is there are advertisements for funeral clothing and there is a dedicated business called the Funeral Board in which you can purchase everything you need for a funeral. Through the newspapers, we learn the language of moving from life to death. Words such as tears, sadness, mourning, solemnity, black clothes, gloves, rings, etc., processions, carriages, and coffins. Right. 
80, but to date there is no evidence in 18th century Limerick newspapers concerning the, concerning the work of masons. And we know that they did uh, make headstones, as there is plenty of evidence um, in the city, particularly in St. Michael's graveyard and uh, Sylvester O'Hallan's graveyard in the 1700s as well. But, I, but not in the newspapers. Andrew Welch as well. He want, asked, he was the printer, he asked to be, yep, okay, interred in the parish church of St. Munchens in Limerick, and he, he had his stone prepared and ready for him before he, um, before he died. Okay, and I will leave it there at that. Okay, thank you. <laughs>